Good morning and welcome to St. John's for those who are in the room, masked and distanced, and those watching on Facebook Live. Whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, you're always welcome here. So we can't sing together in the sanctuary, but we can stand and clap. So I invite you to stand up with us, move a little, and let's worship. Good morning online. Good morning here in the sanctuary. Welcome to St. John's. We all have our newest fashion accessory, correct? Which is our mask. Everybody online, show us your mask. Send us a picture. Let us see. Uh, we've all learned how to put these masks under our chin, on our wrists, in our pockets, in our bags. Let us know online and here in the sanctuary. Where else do you keep your mask when it's not on your face? Have I? Around your neck, neck gaiters, things like that. Well, I say this because we are heading into colder weather, which means that we'll see another run of uh, facial compliments as we head into this cold and flu season. And yet, I'm here to tell you once again that at St. John's, we meet fear with faith, hype with hope, and coronavirus with courage. I don't know how many of you also had whiplash this week from the news. 
I'll talk about that a little bit more during the sermon, right? It's like we can barely keep up with the news that's coming at us like the speed of light. And I am, again, here to tell you that when we root ourselves in our timeless scriptures, when we root ourselves in our faith community, we can withstand the storms of this world. And we're here today to help you do that. So welcome. We start every worship service by warmly greeting one another on this World Communion Sunday. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Jesus Christ be with you all. Please greet one another with the peace of welcome and the and uh, words of welcome, but in the sanctuary, no touching, no hugging. Online, peace, be creative. Please join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. May our worship reflect God's glory. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. May we see each other as the handiwork of God. Let our prayer and praise, our singing and proclamation project the love of God. We gather with Christians around the world, with Christians throughout time, with Christians across geography and across time. Let us worship.
You may be seated. The Hebrew Bible lesson this morning is from the book of Psalms, the 80th chapter. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. Thus ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you. Our New Testament reading today from the lectionary is from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. I'm going to re read certain verses. This is about Paul's letter to the church at Philippi that he wrote from prison, trying to encourage his church as he was imprisoned, but they were free to continue to spread the gospel. And he was trying to teach his church in this way. He writes, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. He's starting to tell us his story. A member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, he's talking about his past, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Now that's a lot. There's a little more, and we'll talk more about this in the sermon. He goes on to say in verses 12 through 14, Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, he says in verse 13, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, good morning, friends. How are you today? I have a question for you to answer on Facebook Live, if you would. So my question is, is for grown-ups and kids alike who are joining us today, what do you do to help you remember things? What's your strategy? People generally have a favorite strategy for ways of remembering things. So pop that up on Facebook Live while I play with this. So today is Communion Sunday. Today is also, we have a globe up here. Anyone know why? Today is also World Communion Sunday where Christians around the globe are celebrating communion today. Have hey, you ever played the game? Well, it's the, glo the globe game was what I always called it, where you take your finger and you close your eyes and you spin it, and wherever you land, like China, or, well, the North Pacific Ocean. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be there. Uh, Congo is another one. Let's see. 
Kentucky, there we go, anyone been to Kentucky? All these fun places, such a great game to think about those places and how they're the same and how they're different from us. So I asked a minute ago, ooh, Zion made some, I got some good answers about what people do at home to help them remember. Let's see. Van says, I threaten myself to not forget. So pure will, Van, I like it. Write it down, make a list, put it on my calendar on my phone, Google Calendar. So lots of, um, oh, and notes on the refrigerator. Another really good one, I like that one. So here are some things that I do to remember, some ways that we remember. Way back in the day, if you're a way back in the day person, do you remember? the story or the belief that if you tied a string around your finger, you would remember what it was you were supposed to remember. I find that not effective. Doesn't work. <laughs> Why is the string on my finger? Um, some other ways that I remember, let's see, I have my calendar. I like to write things down so I keep them in my calendar so I can see the whole big picture. But more and more, I've gotten to putting it on my phone, like a lot of you do, on a Google Calendar, or just a list for each day. I do that, too. Let's see. Um, what are some other things that I do and some other things that people do? Your finger. Yeah, my finger's not helpful. The last thing I have, and I'm sitting here looking at it, is really my favorite way to remember things. And Brian says, yay, post-it notes. Who loves post-it notes? I love post-it notes. You can put them anywhere. And you can stick them on the bathroom mirror. You can put them by the door. You can, I stick them right on top of my purse if there's something I need to remember. So on my post-it note today, I put string, post-it note, calendar, phone, globe. So I think I got it all today. So these are some great ways of remembering things. So at communion, one of the themes of communion is remembering. And it's why we have communion over and over again. It's not just a one-time thing or a once-a-year thing. In some churches, it's an every worship thing. In this church, it's a once-a-month thing. And we're going to hear some remembering language from the band as we move to communion later today. So I just ask you to take a moment, think about people around the globe, some of them gathering in basements or in hidden places because they're not Christians and, and some parts of the, of the world are not allowed to gather publicly, so they might be hiding somewhere. Maybe you're just in your home, which is great. We have a lot of people watching on Facebook Live. You have your juice, you have your bread. If you don't have it set up yet, you have time to do that. And we just remember today. We remember Jesus and his sacrifice. Remember God and God's love for us. And that is the message today. So let's pray. We count to three. One, two, three. And then we clap our hands. Ready? One, two, three. Dear God, thank you for communion that brings us closer to you and closer to each other. Help us to remember you and those around the globe today. In Jesus' name, amen. like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize how beautiful you
If you're watching us from home, remotely, you might be hearing more applause here in the sanctuary as we slowly reopen and we uh, make sure that everyone stays safe with masks and distance and there are additional rules for attending here in the sanctuary. But know that we will continue to broadcast um, online is here to stay. So if you are at home, don't worry, we're going to continue to broadcast um, that's part of our future now, but we also want you to know that we're grateful for those of you who are here back in the sanctuary. For me, sometimes I get, the last couple of weeks, I've been getting a little emotional up here. It's because it's been so many months since I have seen more than just the worship team in the sanctuary. So really, really grateful for all of you who are here today. I want to also thank our, our AV team and our worship band. I say often this is the best worship band in the city of Columbus, but would you all please give them some love online and some applause here in the sanctuary. I just hate for us not to take time to really celebrate all that we have here. Today's message is called the race of a lifetime, and there are a number of ways to think about that, but first, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, there are so many election signs and bumper stickers out there right now, but my favorites are not necessarily always the political ones. So I wanted to start today just to with a little levity to share a couple. If you have some good bumper stickers that you've seen, share them online with us. But I like the one that said, honk if you like peace and quiet. There was another one that I saw yesterday that said, never hit a man with glasses, hit him with a baseball bat. There was a good political one yesterday. It said, in America, anyone can be president. That's one of the risks that you take. And then, you know, bikers often have people riding on the back of the bikes, and there was a biker who had a jacket, and on the back it said, if you can read this, my wife fell off. I thought that one was good. And then there was one that sums up a key dilemma in life, especially during the pandemic, and it said, boldly going nowhere. Boldly going nowhere. And especially during this disillusionment phase of the pandemic, which we talked about last week and last week's sermon, 
This phase of disaster recovery can feel like a forever phase. It can feel like we are boldly going nowhere, like the political supporters who were riding around in circles yesterday on 270, causing fender benders and all sorts of mayhem that didn't really seem to amount to anything positive. And then, while the rest of us are slogging through our own pandemic fatigue and disillusionment and wondering how we're all going to make it through the fall and the winter, the COVID-19 virus strikes down President Trump in a way that is practically biblical, people. I mean, like Old Testament thunderbolts of lightning from Charlton Heston, biblical. Can I get an amen? I always warn people, clergy warn people, do not tempt fate because fate has a very clear way of biting back. Don't tempt fate. So I just want to review for a minute. Let's just take a minute and settle in and review for a minute. Do you remember the presidential debate and the unmasking of the interpreter-in-chief and his family? Raise your hand in the sanctuary, let us know online. Do you remember how the president made fun of Joe Biden for wearing a mask and the Trump family refused to wear their masks during the debate, even though a Cleveland clinic clinician offered them masks when they took theirs off and they refused to wear them, even though the rules that everyone had agreed to ahead of time was that everyone had to wear masks. Do you remember the recent revelation about how little Donald Trump paid in taxes, especially now that he is enjoying taxpayer-funded medical care. Do you remember that? Raise your hand or let us know online if you remember that. Do you remember the nomination of someone new for the U.S. Supreme Court seat to replace the vacated seat um, uh, due to the untimely death of the iconic Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Raise your hand if you remember that. And let us know online. I share this because these events all happened within just the past week or so. This is basically one week in our country's history. So just let that sink in for a minute. And then just as quickly, as we think about all these events, they receded into our memory like a shot with the revelation that Trump on Friday had tested positive for COVID-19. And then like Watergate, the kid, child of Watergate, it was like Watergate, it was what did he know and when did he know it? I think that's going to be the, what we're all going to ask in the weeks to come. What did he know and when did he know it? Because like whack-a-mole on Twitter, I made the mistake of trying to follow Twitter, it was like whack-a-mole, as the whack-a-mole news kept popping up about who was testing positive and who was testing negative in our government and in the Republican Party. And among all those people who attended that Rose Garden event, that now looks like a super spreader event because so many people were not wearing masks. There was a picture that I put on my Facebook page. I encourage you to look at it where historically, I don't think the picture is going to age well because it shows all these people sitting in the Rose Garden too close to each other without masks during a pandemic that had already killed 200,000 people. That picture is not going to age well. But substantial news right now is rushing past us at the speed of light. And we barely have time to absorb the details in our brains and brains that are already bombarded by what we call the daily static of pandemic life. I really appreciated Hank's metaphor that the pandemic is like this constant static that at first is so irritating and we eventually get used to it, but we forget how much energy it's taking for us to rise above that and, and keep functioning. Plus, I saw that COVID cases, this just happened this week, COVID cases are now up 23% in Ohio. Did you see that statistic? They're up 23% in Ohio. And I had to ask why. And I saw that Nicholas Kristof wrote, wrote this just, I think it was yesterday in the New York Times. Because people all over the world, like we just talked about last week, people not just in Ohio, but all over the world are suffering from pandemic fatigue. Can I get an amen online? Raise your hand in the sanctuary. People are suffering from pandemic fatigue. Because honestly, most people are sick of isolation. We crave human contact. 
We want and need hugs in our life. We are social animals, and the deadly coronavirus exploits that instinct in us. We are all becoming more lax as the months go by, particularly in parts of the country where the virus maybe never hit all that hard, people didn't lose friends, or see refrigerator trucks parked outside of our local hospitals to carry all the bodies. If we're not in those parts of the country, we've become a little lax. The problem is, as Nicholas Kristof reminds us, being lax can be lethal, as the President of the United States found out on Friday. Because if the President of the United States, with all of the security and medical science that he has at his disposal, if the President can catch this thing, that means that we all can catch it. Now, has your anxiety just gone like right up here? as we think about that, that if someone with all that security, all that medical care can catch it, that means any one of us can catch it. So while we wrestle with the president's reckless disregard for the health and safety of the people he serves, as he receives the best medical care in the world while trying to strip away affordable care from those who can least afford it, can I get an amen, and the rest of us have once again been stopped in our tracks by the power and the paradox of this pandemic, we have to wonder if we are headed in the right direction during this race of a lifetime. I keep going back to John Barry's important historical work on the 1918 pandemic. You, you all know I mention this book a lot. I hope you read it by John Barry called The Great Influenza. It is history written more like novel, but it's really, really good. And he writes in there, I keep going back. I marked this when I read it because I said, that I, this is just going to keep coming back in a sermon. And it has. It just keeps coming back in my sermons. He writes, if there is a single dominant lesson from 1918, it is that the government needs to tell the truth in a crisis. You can't manage the truth. You tell the truth. Society cannot function if it is every man for himself. By definition, civilization can't survive that. I keep thinking that it will be our historians, our AP government teachers who te taught generations of students. It is going to be those students and those teachers and those historians that actually save us by reminding us not to repeat history. Because the time has come for us to run in a new direction in this country and in our lives, lest we become comfortably numb to our preventable reality due to pandemic fatigue. The time has come for us to run in a new direction unless we want fear and chaos to remain the norm in our society as we wrestle with this chaotic political cycle. The time has come for us to run in a new direction unless we want hate to trump hope. And the time has come for us to run in a new direction unless we want to keep running in place while evil triumphs. This is not a new existential issue. And in this regard, we have much in common with the church in Philippi 2,000 years ago. I mentioned this last week as we began preaching on this material that despite all of the technological and other advances of the last 2,000 years, human nature hasn't changed all that much, and we still wrestle with life's proverbial questions. Well, I want to do a little teaching, because I think these timeless scriptures will help us in this period of history that we're in. The Apostle Paul did not want his beloved church members in Philippi to allow their history to control their destiny because he knew that God intended more for their future than they could possibly imagine. Paul had not allowed his personal history as Saul the Christian persecutor. How many of you know about Paul's conversion? He was Saul before he was Paul. That's another great story to read in the book of Acts today as part of your spiritual discipline. I believe it's in chapter 9 of Acts but Paul had not allowed his history as Saul to control his destiny to become the Apostle Paul, the father of the early Christian church. And no matter what problems you have with Paul and certain clobber passages, 
I will help you with those. Let me know if those are keeping you from getting in the way of your understanding of Paul, but don't let them. Don't let other people taking a couple of clobber passages about Paul keep you from living into the fact that he was the father of the early Christian church, and he was trying to teach his people how to create loving communities. Paul didn't want his church members to allow their past to thwart God's future for their lives and God's future for their church at their westernmost edge of civilization. That's where Philippi was. It was at the westernmost edge of civilization at that time. So to accomplish this task, Paul used a metaphor in his letter to the Philippians that is dominant throughout his writings. He wrote that faith in Jesus Christ or becoming like Jesus is like running a race. It's like running a marathon. And this spiritual race of life is not some 50-yard dash for a fake gold medal or a stay-in-place treadmill exercise of faith. Instead, this is the race of a lifetime, and that's the title of today's sermon. It's the race of a lifetime. It's the race of a lifetime that seeks a prize that matters more than anything else in all the world, which is to become the person, to become the church that God wants and needs us to be in this world. So to explain this life journey, Paul first recounted his own religious history as Saul, the well-credentialed Pharisee, meaning religious leader, and persecutor of the early Jesus church. And Paul could have stayed Saul, the lawyer and persecutor, the rest of his life and retired comfortably from that. But instead, on a road called Damascus, Paul was blinded by events and struck down. And in his blinded weakness, Paul was carried to safety and cared for by one of Jesus' people, a man named Ananias. How many of you have even heard of Ananias? Yes, yes, we have some folks here. If you don't know the story of Ananias, just read the scriptures as part of your discipline. Just just take a look at that this week. Learn more about Ananias. He plays a really pivotal role in our history as Christians. And because of Ananias, Paul came to a new understanding of Christ and everything that he experienced. And his name changed from Saul to Paul is an exegetical exercise for another day. Unless you raise your hand, I'll go through all of that. Seeing no hand, no, John's raising his hand. (laughs) Yes, Hank can, if you have any questions about that, Hank is currently in seminary, text Hank, he will fill you in. But we won't use any more sermon time on that. But the point is, to encourage his congregation in Philippi, Paul reminded the congregation that there was a time when he too had been seeking the wrong prize in life. And he had been blindly running in the wrong spiritual direction. So to give you a contemporary example of what Paul is trying to tell his church, I found a football example because again, it's that time of year, right? Football. And then a 1964 National Football League game Let us know online or raise your hand if you've heard of this example. It's a 1964 National Football League game. The Minnesota Vikings defensive lineman, Jim Marshall, he scooped up a fumble by the San Francisco 49ers receiver, and he saw daylight ahead of him on the field. None of the opposing team's red uniforms stood between him and the end zone some 60 yards away. So Jim Marshall, this is a picture of him, he took off running, well, as running as fast as a big defensive lineman could go. And he was churning down the field in his purple helmet, his purple hat, hat or pants and white jersey, dreaming of touchdowns in his head. Jim Marshall heard the crowd roaring beside him. He saw his teammates running alongside him, waving their arms on the sidelines. And Jim Marshall cruised the last few yards in the end zone, and he celebrated his touchdown by cheerfully tossing the football up in the stands. This is all recorded on early television. Then a player on the other team from the San Francisco 49ers walked up and gave Jim a big hug, and Jim Marshall's eyes were opened. He had just run into the wrong end zone and scored two points for the other guys in red. 
And when you watch the television replay, again, you go on YouTube, you can find this stuff. When you watch the television replay, you can hear the announcer yelling over and over, he's running the wrong way, he's running the wrong way, Marshall is running the wrong way. All the way is he's running the wrong way, right? The only person in the stadium who didn't realize that Jim Marshall was running the wrong way was Jim Marshall. That's a metaphor for life. Well, the Apostle Paul realized that he had been running the wrong way. He had reached the end zone in life. He had been successful in running for the wrong prize, he thought. But these were false victories. The kind of successes that if you keep having them are actually just going to leave you defeated in the end when you reach the end of your life and you take stock and you wonder what it was all for. But instead, on a different path, Ananias gave Paul a big hug. Paul's eyes were opened. He changed his very spiritual identity, his name, and Christianity exploded. So Paul wanted these new Christians in Philippi to develop these same new eyes, this holy imagination that would let them see the explosive future that God had in store for them. Paul writes in verses 13 through 14, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we talk about this in terms of keeping our eyes on the prize. These are the kinds of of scriptures that kept people going during the civil rights and other justice movements, keeping our eyes on the prize. In contemporary language, Paul is saying that true spiritual life is about letting go of the past and courageously living into the future. And this life in Christ Jesus is a race of grace. It is not a grind of guilt. I'll say that again. Put that on your fridge. Life in Jesus is a, ra- is a race of grace and not a grind of guilt. If only we start running in the right direction, seeking the right prize to become the person and the church that God has called us to be. The good news is that we do not have to make the journey alone. There's an old African proverb that says, to run fast, run by yourself, but to run far, Run with other people. You know that one? Put that one on your fridge too. To run fast, run by yourself. But to run far, run with other people. So let me end today with a true story from the Seattle Special Olympics to leave you with hope and a running tip. I thought it was particularly important to share this story again because of everything that's happened in this last week or week and a half in our country where this me-first attitude has gotten us in such trouble. John Berry says it best, that civilization, where was the quote? I'm going to read it again. I'll just read it straight from the book. He writes at page 461, Society cannot function if it is every man for himself. By definition, civilization cannot survive that. And we cannot survive that as a people if our leaders are only out for themselves and not out to help everyone. So let me end with this true story from the Seattle Special Olympics. For the 100-yard dash, there were nine young contestants, all of them with physical or mental disabilities or different abilities. They were differently abled. All nine of the children assembled at the starting line And at the sound of the gun, they took off. But one little boy did not get very far. He stumbled and fell and hurt his knee, and he began to cry. The other eight children were running ahead, and they heard the other little boy cry. They slowed down, they turned around, and ran back to him. Every one of those eight kids ran back to the little boy who had stumbled. This is on film, too. One little girl with Down syndrome bent down and kissed the little boy who fell. 
and said, this will make it better. This will make it better. I've kissed your boo-boo. The little boy got up, and he and the rest of the runners, they linked their arms together, and they joyfully walked to the finish line. They all finished the race at the same time. And when they did, everyone in the stadium stood up and clapped and whistled and cheered for a long, long time. People who were there that day are still telling the story with obvious delight. And do you know why? Because deep down, we know that what matters in this life is more than just winning for ourselves. What really matters is helping others win the race of life too. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, your son taught us that justice requires action so that when we don't know which way to run, especially during this pandemic, we can still find a way forward. So forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, we pray, God, that our history does not become our destiny. Instead, we press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus, helping others all along the way as we cross this finish line of life together, leaving no one behind. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi, my name is Brittany. And my name is Angel. We've been part of the St. John's community since January 2017, and we became members in October 2017. When we were searching for a church that would help us find our faith again after feeling lost and rejected for so many years, we never could have imagined that we could find a place where we could reconnect with God, strengthen our faith, and feel completely loved for who we are. A place where religion and inclusivity are mutually exclusive. A place where the phrase all are welcome actually means all. A place where you feel part of a family. A place where judgment does not exist. A place that embodies God's love. That place is St. John's. We're so grateful that God had a plan for us and guided us to St. John's. From the moment we walked into the sanctuary, we immediately felt peace. We were home. Finally, we found a safe, ple to, a safe place to reunite our relationship with God. We are welcomed with open arms and endless support. Because we found St. John's, we've been able to share our experience with others in our life and help give them hope that they too find their faith again in a church like ours. Not only have we found our faith again, but we've become part of a family with irreplaceable support and unconditional love. When St. John's says all are welcome, they really mean it. We couldn't imagine being a part of any other church. St. John's not only practices what they preach, stands by and affirms their core values and mission, but creates a safe space with God filled with unconditional love by those who surround you. Finding St. John's has been the biggest blessing in our lives. And it brings us such joy knowing that we have found our forever home and to practice our faith with God. Our gratitude to this church and community is immeasurable. St. John's has forever changed and transformed our lives. And come November 7th, St. John's will make what we thought was impossible all our lives actually possible and make our dreams come true by allowing us to get married in this church. We love St. John's and couldn't be prouder to call it our church. Thank you all. We miss you all and peace be with you. We can't wait to see you again. Take care. Angel and Brittany, thank you for that message. It's wonderful to have you share it with us. <clears throat> I am Dave Sarver. I'm St. John's president of Consistory, and I'm here this morning to walk through a stair-step set of slides. About 10 days ago, most of you would have received in the mail a, a letter and a, a stair-step chart that reflects our giving here at St. John's. So I'm going to walk through that as part of our program for our Consecration Sunday, which comes up in two weeks. This is the stair step, 
and we're going to go step by step here and talk about where we are in 2020. If we go to the next slide, we have 53 giving units, and a giving unit is either an individual or a couple, but we have 53 giving units who in 2020 are giving at a level between a penny and five dollars per week to St. John's. One thing that's very positive about this slide is 33 of those 53 are individuals who never gave anything to St. John's prior to 2020. We go to the next slide. We have eight giving units between $5 and $10. The next one, we have 13 between $10 and $20. The next one, nine between $20 and $29. We have five between $30 and, and $40. We have three between $40 and $50. We have seven between $50 and $75. We have three between $75 and $100. We have three between $100 and $150. Between $150 and $200, we have three. In the last step, we have four who are giving at a rate of $200 or more per week to St. John's. This, this chart here reflects weekly income on the left-hand side. You should have it because it was part of the mailing that you received at home. If you look down the chart to see where you fall on the weekend giving, what we're asking is that over the course of the next two weeks, you think about the question, what is God calling me to give to St. John's? What is God calling me to give to support the work of St. John's? You can look at the percentages across the talk and what I'm going to ask you to do, and we can go to the next slide here, there are really two things that I would like you to focus on coming out of this. The first is the estimate of giving, and you will receive in the mail in the upcoming weeks an actual physical estimate of giving card. You will also be able to access through this link, and this link will appear in our shining light, or some, many of us call it the beacon, which comes out every Friday afternoon. So if you're on our email list, you'll get it in the beacon. You can click, uh, scroll down through the beacon till you come to Consecration Sunday. You can click on the link and you can fill out the card there. What we are asking you to do in two weeks, we will have the Reverend David Long Higgins, who's the uh, minister for the Heartland Conference of the UCC. We're very fortunate to have David here that Sunday. He will be preaching. Following his service, you will be given an opportunity on Facebook Live to again click the link and fill out an estimate of giving card. So what I'm asking you to do today is over the next two weeks, really take, take some time, find some quiet time, find some, some time to be alone by yourself and think through the question, what is God calling me to give to support the work of St. John? So that's one ask. The second ask is to RSVP. On Sunday, the 18th of October, from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, we're going to have a box lunch celebration luncheon. It's going to be in the parking lot and on the lawn of the Westerville UCC, which is at 770 County Line Road in Westerville. They've got a beautiful, spacious parking lot. They've got a lawn. We're going to gather there and join, but we're asking you to RSVP if you can come to that box lunch luncheon. And when you RSVP, it will ask you whether you'd like a vegetarian entree or a meat entree, etc. So you'll be given choices. But please do RSVP because if we do not hear from you, we will be following up to check to see whether you will be coming. So even if you're not coming, please RSVP and let us know that that's possible. Thank you for your time, but again, please reflect in the next two weeks, what is God calling you to give to the work of St. John's? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Can we please give Dave Sarver a round of applause for being here today and 
with his wife, Cappy, and helping us walk through our Consecration Sunday process. This is a very important process for us this time of year. We're so grateful for all of you who are here as well as online because we need your support to build the future of this church. We need your support to make it through this pandemic. We need your support to be the people God is calling us to be and the church God is calling us to be, to be here to help a hurting world. So please follow all the instructions that are being shared. Visit our website, our church Facebook page. Call us if you need additional information. And a special thank you to Brittany and Angel as well for their courageous testimony, for their journey with us. Can we give them a round of applause as well? Their wedding is coming up now in about a month, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So in thanksgiving for God's blessings to us, let us give of our treasure as an offering to God through the ministry of this church. Please join us in our time of offering. i 
Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask for your understanding as we journey through this time of pandemic. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon all those who are suffering with this horrible virus that they might recover. We ask all of those who are in privileged positions of receiving a prompt attention and medical care that they use all of their gifts to make sure that everyone in this country and in this world has access to such care. We remember all those who have lost their lives, their families and their loved ones, and all of those who continue to suffer long-term effects from this virus. Help us bind together as a people, God, to journey together not in fear but in faith, that not in helplessness but in hope, knowing, God, that you are leading us into the creation of a whole new world order. Help us to remember that each of us has a part to play in that and that you are calling us toward hope, goodness, wholeness, and love as we pray as your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We move now into our communion litany here at St. John's. We have communion once a month on Sundays, and when we resume worship on Wednesdays, eventually we have communion every week. But for now, we have communion once a month on Wednesdays. But we start every communion litany by confessing our sins, because if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you are viewing us from home, please repeat the section that says all, because our folks here in the sanctuary, due to our requirements around mask and distance and gathering, they're not allowed to repeat these words out loud. So do it for us at home. Let us know at home that you're following the litany. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Most merciful God, we, are, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and follow in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. 
Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Anyone in Christ becomes a new person altogether. That was the message today. The past is finished and gone. Everything right here, right now, has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. No one who comes to me will I drive away, because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Please join me in the unison prayer of our faith at home and here in the sanctuary, quietly here in the sanctuary, loudly there at home. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere, and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family on this World Communion Sunday to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered. With your sons and daughters of faith in all places and times, we praise you with joy. Please be seated here and at home. Well, we're doing things a little bit differently when it comes to the words of institution. You all have what we call the communion lunchable. On this World Communion Sunday, in the middle of a pandemic, we are all going to be using our communion lunchables. Show you us at home your communion elements, because we're all encouraging you to be as creative as possible. If we can't find some humor in the midst of all of this, right, what are we doing as church? But we have our communion lunchables. Now, we'll wait to consume it until I give you the cue. But rather than, in order to preserve our places here in the sanctuary and to be as safe as possible, I'm doing everything from the pulpit, and we're really not touching anything unless it's ours. So today, I get to use the wafer as my example of the bread that's there at the table. 
But on the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, wafer today, but Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to those gathered, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And likewise, on that same night, Jesus took the cup, and after he had given thanks, you open your little cup. You have to do it in advance. It's a little tough. After he had given thanks, he gave it to those gathered, saying, Take, drink. This is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, the blood of the new covenant. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Please join me in the affirmation of faith printed on the screen. Christ has died Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray before we consume our elements. Holy One, show forth among us the presence of your life-giving word and Holy Spirit to sanctify us and your entire church through these holy mysteries. Grant that all who share the communion of the body and blood of our risen Savior may be one in Jesus Christ. May we remain faithful in love and hope until the perfect feast with our exalted Savior in the eternal joy of your heavenly realm. Please join me. Gracious God, accept with favor this our sacrifice of praise, which we now present with these holy gifts. We offer to you ourselves, giving you thanks for the perfect offering of the only one begotten by you, Jesus Christ our Savior, by whom and with whom and in whom, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be to you, eternal God, now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready for you. And normally, when it's not a pandemic, this is the part where people would come forward in the sanctuary and receive their elements. But now we're doing this at home, and in the sanctuary, people have to remain seated. So I'm just gonna do this now and we're gonna do it together at the same time. This is the body of Christ, the bread of life, consume and be filled. This blood of Christ, may you drink and never thirst. Please join me in the unison prayer of thanksgiving printed on the screen. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As you prepare to leave from this place today, we're so grateful you could join us online and here in the sanctuary. A reminder that we have an RSVP system that is required to enter the sanctuary. So if you'd like to come and participate in a worship service, remember you need to make an advance reservation so that we can make sure there's plenty of room in the sanctuary during the pandemic so that you have your temperature taken and you can follow all the rules that we have to keep everyone safe in the sanctuary. So we would love to throw open our doors um, during this time, but unfortunately that's not safe for us to do so. But we have a slow reopening process that is going quite well, but there is an RSVP system. So we do want to ask that all of our guests observe that. And if you don't have a reservation, we're so sorry, but we will make sure and welcome you back next week. But as you leave from this place today, as you settle into the message that you have heard and the times in which we live, as you let live in charity resonate in your spirit, I ask you to receive this benediction and take it forward into the week ahead, no matter what the news cycle has to deliver to you. No matter what else is happening in this world, may these words settle into your spirit. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace while you go forth to live the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen.